My name is Jay Apt. I'm the director of the Carnegie Mellon Electricity Industry Center, a joint project of the Tepper School of Business and the Engineering and Public Policy Department. We actually have people from seven different departments at Carnegie Mellon, about uh, 15 active faculty, about two dozen active PhD students. It's the largest interdisciplinary center in the world studying the problems of the electric power industry. And let me tell you, there are really exciting problems. When I was a kid, we are using, we used one-eighth the electric power that we use now. Even though the population is only up by a factor of two, the use of electric power is up by a factor of eight. It's just amazing. You can see here how it has grown in the time since 1950. It shows no sign at all of slacking off. And so where do we get our electric power from? In this country, we get it about half from coal, about 25% from natural gas, about 20% from nuclear power, and a smattering of a few other things, mostly hydroelectric power. When we talk about the future of clean energy in this country, we generally mean clean electricity. And the way that we're going to get that, most people presume, is from renewable energy. So where is our renewable energy coming from today? At the moment, we have about two-thirds of the renewable energy coming from hydroelectric power. About a quarter of it comes from wind. Now, wind is the fastest growing piece of all of our renewable energy. Most people, when they say, how are you going to solve the electricity problem, they think about solar energy. Indeed, there's 4,000 times as much sunlight falls on the United States as we need. But the problem is it's terribly expensive. And so there's a tiny sliver of our power that is put out by sunlight. So let's concentrate on wind. Well, we've spent a fair amount of time doing research in the mathematics of wind power. Wind power is the fastest growing of all of our energy sources, but it's variable, just like hydroelectric power. This slide shows the variation since 1970 of hydroelectric power in the United States. It's up and down by 20 to 40 percent. Well, what about wind? Wind, it turns out, on small time scales is even more variable uh, than water power. This is a picture of all of the wind turbines in the great state of Texas. It's the largest concentration of wind anywhere in the United States of America. And as you can see, it goes up and down and up and down on all time scales. So we started examining the mathematical character of that. It's not white noise. It's not the same amount of power at all frequencies. It turns out that's really good. Because if it was white noise, we'd need as many fast ramping sources, really expensive ones, as we do slow ramping sources to buffer the wind power. Because of what we found, we now know that we can integrate wind power into the system by using slow ramping fossil fuel plants, as well as really ultra-modern things like superconducting magnetic energy storage. We just don't need so much of that. That's a really good thing. So we asked some different questions about wind. We asked over the time of a few years, do we have droughts in the wind like we have droughts in the water power? And the answer when we looked at it is yes. There's going to be windy years and not so windy years. So we have to take that into account just like we do for a hydroelectric power. And then we said, well, you know, if you put a lot of wind in and you put a lot of reliance on your wind, what are the chances that the wind is just going to die, have a big high pressure area come over you and kill all the wind for a while? Well, if you look at the state of Oregon, up in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S., we found that in January, a few years ago, there were two weeks with no wind power at all. What you see in the slide is the falling off of the wind so that it didn't generate a thing. So no matter how much wind power you put in the system, you're going to have to put quite a lot of other energy in the system in order to buffer it. Well, now let's turn to solar power. You look outside on a sunny day in Arizona and you think, well, gee whiz, the sun is just beating down solar power, at least during the daytime, has to be completely a wonderful source of power. It's got to be constant, no problems. So we looked at two years of data from the largest solar plant in the country at the time. And what we found was that on some days, indeed, the sunlight goes up. As the sun reaches noon, it starts then to go down. It's beautiful. But the very next day, 
look at what happened. What's happened here is clouds. And clouds have gotten in the way of the sun. And indeed, the clouds interrupt the sun so fast that in the bottom part of the slide, you can see that it is even more variable than wind power. So again, we looked at the mathematical characterization of the sunlight and found that it's going to be more expensive to integrate solar power, at least from photovoltaic panels, into the grid than it is wind power. So it's those kind of things that we're learning about the advanced electric power system that we hope will take us into the grid of the future. And the opportunities for our PhD students to really do all the work are fantastic. They are going to have a wonderful time over their lifetime in this really exciting field.